All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and um, get started then. If you have not already done so, please make sure you guys go into CTLS. Go to today's digital session. What we're going to do here, let me go ahead and share my screen again. Let's go to the TV screen. All right, what we're going to do right now is just listen to this vocabulary about World War I. Just introduce it. Has anyone not ever learned anything about World War I? Y'all can open your mics out. What was that movie? Uh, was it 1917? That, yeah. Like last year, the year before? Yeah. Yeah, the one of, uh, yeah, that was a good one too. Mm -hmm. um, yes, let me say this too. Um, anybody that needs to take the test, the test is open. I'm monitoring it. Go ahead and take it. There's about 16 of you right now that need to take the test. I'm not going through the list of seeing everybody that's in class or not, but if you need to take the test, this would be an opportunity to take it. Um, if you did not finish it, you guys got until 2 o'clock. No questions asked. I am closing at 2 o'clock so I can submit my grades. But I want to make sure that y'all take these zeros out because those zeros hurt your grade. And this is being recorded, so you guys can always come back in to watch this um, recording and get your stuff for today. All right. So let's go ahead and start this video. Can you guys hear the music? I'm gonna go to original speed, y'all. Y'all be good. Thank you for everybody that got the cameras on. I appreciate it. Um, I can barely hear it. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Um, cause yeah, what the I'm music doing... comes across great, but like the lyrics are difficult. Okay. That's what I need to know. Discern. Mm -hmm. All right. Although it's great that you have the subtitles showing. Okay, I'm going to restart. Okay, you guys, y'all should definitely gonna be able to hear it now. That helps. Um, Thank you. All right, here you go. No better? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they sent us all to war. They told us to be ready to fight. But all they really cared about was if we were ready to die. It's called the Great War, I guess I know why Cause it was so big, and so many died Like me? Yeah, I'm just a ghost coming back from the past Just to pass you a note and pass on what I know Yeah, I've seen a lot, I've seen soldiers line up and seen them drop Where should I begin? What was the meaning? Those who don't remember mistakes, repeat them And why did it happen? I'ma sound out the reasons first All these European states were scheming Imperialism, they wanted to expand Control people, control land Plus they had new ships and guns Militarism, that's how these nations spending their funds And they had alliances and packs Like if you punch him, I'ma punch you back 
And the people just cheer and grin Nationalism, everyone wants a team to win Yeah, it was like a bomb set to blow Was it inevitable? Well, that's debated But when Franz Ferdinand was assassinated The camel's back broke That was the last straw When Domino goes down, they all fall like I saw my best friend die But I still see Propaganda's all over, they're selling the war Telling us all lies to enlist us Saying we would return to our loved ones by Christmas We were so amped, thought war was harmless How can you hug your family when you're armless? Stuck in the trench like a baseball dugout But when they get a hit, we have to pull a slug out And back home, they're eating rations Just a little food that has to last In total war, we're all playing our parts Women in factories, making our parts, African armies, colonial soldiers, all fighting Europe, they're following orders, new technology versus old tactics, that means the whole death toll is massive, new weapons, they're killing us fast with submarines, tanks and poisonous gases, big guns that go, machine gun fire make a boy fall flat, it's not all quiet on the western front, nor the eastern front, I won't even front, I'm so shell shocked, I don't speak for months They might ship me in a box to my grieving mom I'm scared, I'm cold Soaked through my coat Four years later, yes. a little hope Armistice, the fire ceased Then the Treaty of Versailles meant peace They cut up Eastern Europe Put shackles on Germany Think that'll work out? Certainly At least this was the war to end war We'll never have another world war For sure I saw my best friend die, but I still see him, he's right there by my side. I saw my best friend die, but I still see him, he's right there by my side. I saw my best friend die, but I still see him. I got a question. Sometimes you guys ever see yourself um, like going back and reciting some of these songs? No. No, not really. All right. Just curious. All right. So this is what we're about to do now. I posted a link. Um, into the chat. That's what we're going to be working on today. Um, but I also want to show it to you guys in CTLS. All right, so let me show you guys CTLS. All right, so we're going to go to today's class, P1. Remember, if you guys, I posted this right here about the video, kind of already talked about it as well. If you need to take the test, it's going to be right here for you. But right now, you want to go to the digital sessions. We'll scroll down all the way. These digital sessions are always going in order. Click right here for today's lesson. Um, this is the link that you guys need to make sure you guys open up. And here's a Nearpod that you guys got to do complete um, by tonight. Now, everything we're doing right now, you guys have time to go back and review it. Okay. Um, as a reminder, you guys gonna have a pop quiz tomorrow after um, tomorrow morning that's gonna cover World War One. Something else I want to show everybody too, um, and I want to thank Amanda. They did a lot of upgrades to CTLS, so they finally are really trying to make it look more like the way Canvas looks. So it'll be a little bit more user friendly, if you will. All right, so if you go down, I'm gonna show you guys something. And this is something I was kind of referring to earlier. There's extra credit, okay, right here, where it says, well, somebody tell me, what does this say right here? Uh, film and footage. Um, film. Yes, so that is something you guys can do. Um, and this is gonna be due, um, on December 4th, this is extra credit. You guys can do as many of these as you want. When you click on it right here, you have two links to my blog. 
complete the assignment submitted. This is extra credit you guys can do continuously up until December 4th, which is the first Friday in December. Does everybody follow me there? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you can do as many as you guys want of those. It doesn't matter. You can either basically to give you a nutshell, you got to do exactly as it says on the website. You do any kind of variation, you not get points. But you can do a field trip. You guys know how, like, you walk, you look around Atlanta. If you ever pay attention, there's like little placards that's all over the city of Atlanta and the surrounding areas. You guys ever notice those? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Those are typically from the Civil War. Those are like little placards talk about Civil War events. All I'm asking you to do, go do a selfie with your with the placard next to you. Do like a quick write up on it, and you get extra credit. <laughs> okay. And then you also can watch movies. Somebody give me some historical movies that they've seen over the last couple months. Nobody's watching anything on TV? The Crucible? Uh, I was trying to say Roots, but it doesn't involve U.S. history. So what, what, okay, you got the Crucibles. What did you say, Cameron? Roots. Yeah, Roots is actually all U.S. history. It is. So you can use that one, too, because it goes into Civil War. So any of those movies, and there's a list of them also I put on there. If you guys want to watch one movie that I hope we may have time to watch, it will be the movie Detroit. We're going to watch that in class. Uh, even American Story of Us is. Um... The one with uh, P. Henson, Tajay P. Henson, I can't think of it. Um, what's the name of that movie? I'm so hungry right, right now. <laughs> Me too. Um, uh, with the with the ladies that was in the NASA, I forgot the well, name. It starts of that next movie. week. No, it doesn't. Sure, yes. no, what's it... the name of that movie? Uh, any, anyway, any movie you guys want to watch, you guys that's can do nice. that to be able to get extra credit. So that can help you guys out too. So that's an option for you guys. Okay. Y'all cool with that option? You got two options. All right. Yes. So what I need you guys to do right now is to go back into the digital session. And what I need you guys to do is click on it. What I need you to do is open up this document right here, World War I um, one day lesson. And that's what we're going to work on. I also posted the link to it in the chat just to help you guys out. I'm posting the link again. You guys like a minute? Hidden Figures, yes. That's another movie you guys can watch for extra credit too. Um, so you guys have options. So go ahead and open up that document and we're about to jump into that now, okay? Give you guys like a minute or two as I switch screens back. Ms. Gary, you know of any other movies that they can that comes up when you think about US history? You said 1917, um, the uh Battle of Midway. Pearl Harbor. What's some other movies? Oh, Lincoln. Um, Free State of Jones. Free State of yeah, exactly. Free yeah. State of Joneses. Um, you can even watch Amistad. Um, y'all see where I'm going? There's a lot of movies y'all can pick from. Is what I'm getting at. Um, so utilize that. I'm actually giving y'all extra credit to go sit down and watch a movie. You're welcome. Y'all not saying thank you. It's kind of hurt my feelings. All right. So, thank you. You're welcome. See, now I'm smiling. You're welcome. And y'all do know, like, that's just more work for us to go back and grade. So, it's not like I'm wanting to do it necessarily, but it's something I got. Can everybody see the screen right here with the notes up? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, I'm still here. I'm using my Bluetooth, but I'm in front of the class now. All right. So, we're going to start off with this crash courses. So, you guys want to answer these as much as possible. Um, we're going to show it one time in class. If you guys need to go back after school to watch it, you can. Does everybody see these take uh, these note-taking guys right here? Does everybody see this? Yeah. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys all the answers to this. So I'm going to give you guys these answers. Does everybody follow me on that? Yes. So if you have this yeah. printed, that's cool. If you guys want to just write on your piece of paper, that's cool. But this is going to help you guys out with that. Um, Ms. Garrity, could you let that person in for me and just let me know who it is so I can put it in attendance? Yeah, I did. Thank you. All right, so this is what we'll be going through today. And then what do you guys have tomorrow morning when you come into class on World War One? A quiz. A you quiz. have a quiz on all this material, OK? So here is the crash course. I have the captions up for you guys. I'm not going to slow this down, but you guys can go back and rewatch this tonight if you need to. So let me reiterate this with you guys. Make sure everybody's clear on this 100%. Dr. Tilwell is not taking these notes and grading it. I'm going to give you all a pop quiz to see if y'all took the notes or not. Is everybody clear on that now? Yeah. Yeah. 
these notes are going to help you pass the pop quiz tomorrow. The pop quiz does go in the gray book tomorrow. Is everybody clear? Yes. 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 So here's the, which I'm going to show this video to you guys now. It's going to be about 11 and a half, 12, 14 minutes. And then I'm going to give you guys the filling notes. So basically, I'm not going to get half of you guys to go do the reading. I'm not going to have you guys do the PowerPoint. I'm going to give it to you guys. All you guys do is record it down, give you guys some more background, and then you guys have some time to study for the pop quiz tomorrow in World War One. We cool? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Here you go. So listen up, and this goes in order. So just one more thing I want to tell you about the notes, too. So if you go to, like, right here, it says number five. five. Explain the Schneck case and its significance. So one box to the left is where you guys explain it, and then on the right is where you guys put the significance. Does everybody understand that now? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here you guys go. On Green, this is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're finally going to make military history buffs happy. That's right, today we're going to talk about how the United States, with its superior technology, innovative tactics, and remarkable generalship, turned the tide of World War I. Mr. Green, Mr. Green! Finally, I've been waiting for months to learn about tanks and airplanes and Ernest Hemingway. Well, that's a shame, me, from the past, because I was kidding about this being an episode full of military details. But I do promise that we will mention Ernest Hemingway, and in a few weeks I will tell you about how he liberated the Martinis of Paris. <laughs> Compared with the other belligerents, we didn't do much fighting. Still, the war had profound effects on America at home, on its place in the world, and it also resulted in an amazing number of war memorials right here in Indianapolis. So the Great War, which lasted from 1914 until 1918 and featured a lot of men with hats and rifles, cost the lives of an estimated 10 million soldiers. Also, the whole thing was kind of horrible and pointless. Unless you love art and literature about how horrible and pointless World War I was, in which case it was a real bonanza. So when the war broke out, America remained neutral because we were a little bit isolationist owing to the fact that we were led, of course, by President Wilson. But many Americans sided with the British because by 1914 we'd pretty much forgotten about all the bad parts of British rule, like all that tea and monarchy. Plus, they're so easy to talk to with their English. But there were a significant number of progressives who worried that involvement in the war would get in the way of social reforms at home. In fact, Wilson courted these groups in the 1916 presidential campaign, running on the slogan, he kept us out of war and will continue to keep us out of war until we re-elect him and then he gets us into war. But for that slogan to make sense, there had to have been some way in which war was avoided, which brings me to one of the classic errors made by American history students. What? I haven't even said anything yet. But you were about to me from the past, because if I had asked you what event led the U.S. to enter World War I, you would have surely told me that it was the sinking of the cruise ship Lusitania by German submarines. 124 American passengers died when the ship, which which had been carrying arms and also guns, was torpedoed off the coast of Ireland. Even though Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan had warned Americans not to travel on British, French, or German ships, Wilson refused to ban such travel because, you know, freedom. Brian promptly resigned. So how do I know it wasn't the immediate cause of our involvement in the war? Because the United States declared war on Germany and the Central Powers on April 2nd, 1917, almost two years after the sinking of the Lusitania. So why did the United States declare war for only the fourth time in its history? Was it the Germans' decision to resume unrestricted submarine warfare in early 1917? Was it the interception and publication of the Zimmerman telegram in which the German foreign secretary promised to help Mexico get back California? if they joined Germany in a war against the U.S.? Or was it the fall of the Tsarist regime in Russia, which made Wilson's claims that he wanted to fight to make the world safe for democracy a bit more plausible? Yes, yes, and yes. Also, there was our inclination to help Britain, to whom we had loaned two billion dollars. That's the thing about wars. They never start for easy, simple reasons like Lusitania sinking. Stupid truth, always resisting simplicity. Oh, it's time for the mystery document? The rules here are simple. I guess the author of the mystery document, I'm either right or I get shocked. I, or possibly one, open covenants of peace openly arrived at, after which there shall be no private international understandings of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly and in the public view. I, I, I'm starting to think these are Roman numerals, absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas, outside territorial waters, alike in peace and in war, except as the seas may be closed in whole or in part by international action for the enforcement of international covenants. 
Three, the removal, so far as possible, of all economic barriers and the establishment of an equality of trade conditions among all nations consenting to the peace and associating themselves for its maintenance. And 14, I'm going to guess we skipped some, a general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity of great and small states alike. Stan? Thank you for throwing me a softball. That's my favorite kind of ball. Other than you, Wilson. With its mention of self-determination, freedom of the seas, open diplomacy, and liberal use of Roman numerals, I know it is Woodrow Wilson's 14 points, our second consecutive Woodrow Wilson week, and my second consecutive non-shock. Given all of his quasi-imperialism, there's something a little bit ideologically inconsistent about Wilson, but his 14 points are pretty admirable as a statement of purpose. Most of them deal specifically with colonial possessions and were pretty much ignored, but I suppose if we've learned anything, it's that in American history, it's the thought that counts. America's primary contribution to the Entente powers winning the war was economic, as we sent all sorts of arms and money over there. Troops didn't arrive until the spring of 1918, and eventually over one million American doughboys served under General John J. Pershing. Not all of these people saw combat. They were much more likely to die of flu than bullet wounds. But their sheer numbers were enough to force the defeat of the exhausted Germans. And now, as promised, I will mention Ernest Hemingway. He served as an ambulance driver, which gave him a close-up view of death and misery and led to his memory membership in the so-called lost generation of writers who lived in Paris in the 1920s and tried to make sense of everything. Turns out it's pretty hard to make sense of, and you're just going to end up with a lot of six-toed cats and then eventually suicide. Okay, so I said earlier that a lot of American progressives were anti-war, but certainly not all of them. Like, according to Randolph Bourne, war is the health of the state, and for progressives like him, the war offered the possibility of reforming American society along scientific lines, instilling a sense of national unity and self-sacrifice, and expanding social justice. Let's go to the thought bubble. World War I made the national government much more powerful than it had ever been. Like in May of 1917, Congress passed the Selective Service Act, which required 24 million men to register for the draft and eventually increased the size of the army from 120,000 to 5 million. The government also commandeered control of much of the economy to get the country ready to fight, creating new agencies to regulate industry, transportation, labor relations, and agriculture. The War Industries Board took charge of all elements of wartime production, setting quotas and prices and establishing standardized specification for almost everything, even down to the color of shoes. The Railroad Administration administered transportation, and the Fuel Agency rationed coal and oil. This regulation sometimes brought about some of the progressives' goals, like the War Labor Board, for instance, pushed for a minimum wage, eight-hour workdays, and the rights of workers to form unions. Wages rose substantially in the era, working conditions improved, and union membership skyrocketed. But then, so did taxes, and the wealthiest Americans ended up on the hook for 60% of their income. Also, in World War I, as never before, the government used its power to shape public opinion. In 1917, the Wilson administration created the Committee on Public Information, which only sounds like it's from an Orwell novel. Headed by George Creel, the CPI's team created a wave of propaganda to get Americans to support the war, printing pamphlets, making posters, and advertising in swanky motion pictures. The best known strategies were the speeches of 75,000 four-minute men, who in that amount of time delivered messages of support for the war in theaters, schools, and other public venues. The key concepts in the CPI propaganda effort were democracy and freedom. Creel believed that the war would accelerate movement towards solving the age-old problems of poverty, inequality, oppression, and unhappiness. Because obviously, war is the most effective antidepressant. Thanks, Thought Bubble. So the aforementioned Randolph Bourne might have had good things to say about war, but he was also correct when he suggested that the war would encourage and empower the, quote, least democratic forces in American life. World War I may have been a war to make the world safe for democracy, but according to one historian, the war inaugurated the most intense repression of civil liberties the nation has ever known. War suppressing civil liberties, eh? I'm glad those days have passed. Speaking of the repression of civil liberties, the NSA is about to start watching this video because I'm about to use the word espionage. The Espionage Act of 1917 prohibited spying, interfering with the draft, and, quote, false statements that might impede military success. Even more troubling was the Sedition Act, passed in 1918, which criminalized 
criminalize statements that were intended to cast contempt, scorn, or disrepute on our form of government, or that advocated interference with the war effort. So basically, these laws made it a crime to criticize either the war or the government. In fact, Eugene Debs, the socialist who ran for president in 1912, was one of those convicted for giving an anti-war speech. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, and he served three of them, but he ran for president from prison and got 900,000 votes. Fortunately, thanks to checks and balances, you can turn to the courts. Unfortunately, they weren't very helpful. Like in Shank versus the U.S., the Supreme Court upheld the conviction of a guy named Shank for encouraging people to avoid the draft and ruled that the government can punish critical speech when it presents a clear and present danger to the state and its citizens. This was when Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes introduced the famous exception to free speech that it is not okay to shout fire in a crowded theater. Nor apparently is it okay to shout we shouldn't be in this war, I don't think. Just my opinion. But some went even further. The 250,000 strong American Protective League helped the Justice Department identify radicals by harassing people in what were called slacker raids. Good thing those stopped before you got to high school, right? Me from the past? Slacker. In Bisbee, Arizona, vigilantes went so far to put striking copper miners in boxcars, shipped them out to the middle of the desert, and left them there. The war also raised the question of what it meant to be a real American, like public schools Americanized immigrants and sought to implant in their children so far as can be done the Anglo-Saxon conceptions of righteousness, law and order, and popular government. Many cities sponsored Americanization pageants, especially around the 4th of July, which the CPI in 1918 rechristened Loyalty Day. Hamburgers, a German word, became liberty sandwiches. World War I certainly didn't create anti-immigrant feeling in the United States, but it was used to justify it. Like IQ tests introduced to screen army applicants were soon used to argue that certain immigrant groups were inferior to white Protestants and could never be fully assimilated into the United States. Now, of course, those tests were tremendously biased, but no matter. But to return to the questions of dissent and free speech, the suppression continued after the war, with the 1919 Palmer raids, for instance, named after Attorney General A. Mitchell Palmer, and headed up by a young J. Edgar Hoover. To be fair, someone did try to blow up Palmer, so there was some dissent related to the suppression of dissent. Also, more than four million workers engaged in strikes in the United States in 1919, but that didn't legally justify the arrest of more than 5,000 suspected radicals and labor organizers. Most of them were arrested without warrants and held without charge, sometimes for months. And it's difficult to imagine that all of this would have happened without the heightened sense of patriotism that always accompanies war. However, there were a handful of good things Things to come out of the Great War, and not just the stylings of Irving Berlin. Like, students are often taught that the war led directly to the passage of the 19th Amendment, although a number of states had actually granted the franchise to women before the war. In Montana, for instance, women didn't just vote, they held office. Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin voted against the Declaration of War in 1917 and was the only member of the House to vote against the Declaration of War against Japan in 1941. New opportunities in wartime industry also provided incentives for African Americans to move north, thus beginning the so-called Great Migration and the growth of black populations in northern cities like Chicago and New York. The biggest gain was in Detroit, where between 1910 and 1920, the black population rose from 5,741 to 40,838, a 611% increase. So it's true that World War I provided some new opportunities for African Americans and women, but if World War I was supposed to be an opportunity for America to impose its progressive ideas on the rest of the world, it failed. The Versailles Peace Conference, where Wilson tried to implement his 14 points, raised hope for a new diplomatic order, but the results of the treaty made the 14 <coughs> points look hypocritical. I mean, especially when Britain and France took control of Germany's former colonies and carved up the Arabian provinces of the Ottoman Empire into new spheres of influence. Wilson's dream of a League of Nations was realized, but the U.S. never joined it, largely because Congress was nervous about giving up its sovereign power to declare war. And disappointment over the outcome of World War I led the U.S. to, for the most part, retreat into isolationism until World War II. And therein lies the ultimate failure of World War I. It's not called the World War, it's called World War I, because then we had to go and have a frickin' other one. We'll talk about that in a few weeks, but next week we get to talk about suffrage. Yes, we finally did something right. I'll see you then. Crash Course is produced and directed by... All right, so, I know that's a lot of information. That's why I say you guys can always go back and rewatch this. This is on YouTube. Um, I just want to kind of give you guys information because, again, this is something we talk a lot about in world history, and there's only one perspective we want to look at it from the United States' perspective. Um, however, with that being said, this is typically considered a forgotten war because World War II happened and it was even worse. Um, but let's kind of get into the nutshell of what this was.
So I'm going to, again, we're going to move down now. And I'm going to give you guys these fill-ins, okay? So I'm going to go up in front of the board, and you guys can kind of follow along with me. Don't walk, don't put anything in the chat because I'm not on the computer. I got Miss Gary just to help out with that. But I just want to make sure you guys get this information. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. All right. First of all, let me tell you guys this. These standards are based off the old standards when I first started teaching. So which is still standard 15, which is World War I, but the way it's worded is a lot different. So first, let me make sure you guys know this. You have the central powers and you have the allies. The central powers is going to be Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire. Can I get somebody to read who the allies were? Russia, France, Russia, Serbia, Russia. Great Britain. And then later, go ahead and put in there the United States. We came into the war a lot later. Uh, once Russia started their uh, revolution, it forced the United States to come into it. And also some of the reasons I'm about to tell you right now. So number five, the later was United States, USA. All right, so for causes for US entry into the war, unrestricted submarine warfare by Germany. So unrestricted submarine warfare by Germany. So again, you guys can either write this on your own sheet of paper if you guys want to. Um, you could type it into the document. I see about maybe five. I see a lot of you guys in the document. You can type it in if you want to. And remember, if you're typing it in, click right here where it says file. Click right here where it says make a copy. And then you better make your own copy. You also can download it and you can do it that way too. Okay, y'all? All right, number two, sinking of the Lusitania. That's L-U-I-S-I-T-A-N-I-A, which was a British passenger ship by Germany. Can you say that again? Yeah. Um, sinking of the Lusitania. That's L-U-I-S-I-T-A-N-I-A. Okay. Who was the first one? The first one will be submarine in Germany. Submarine in Germany. So again, you guys, I'm recording this met this um this lesson for you guys, so you guys can go back and re-listen to this too. Okay, y'all. I got y'all. All right, number three, thinking of the Sussex and the Sussex Pledge, a French passenger ship sunk by the Germany. So this number three is gonna be French. Number four, make sure you guys circle number four. Actually circle number one, number four as well. Number one, number one, four, five, and six. These are directly related to the United States. Number four is the Zimmerman, Zimmerman, Zimmerman Telegram an intercept telegram that proposed an alliance between Germany and Mexico. What they was basically doing here is that what uh, Germany said is that if Mexico rebels against the United States, they'll get back all their old land. And when did, they, when did Mexico lose their land? In what war? Does everybody remember? The Spanish-American War? The war before that. <laughs> it starts with the country Mexico. I'm guessing the compromise of 1820. The Mexican-American War. Y'all remember that now? Yes. So the Mexican-American War is when the United States lost the war. They lost all their territory in the Southwest. And what Germany did with the German telegram is say, hey, guess what? You go against the United States, we give you back all your land. And of course, you know, the United States did not like that very much. Uh, number five is going to be the Russian Revolution. The royal family was forced out by Lenin, L-E-N-I-N, and the Bolsheviks. This caused Russia to back out of the war and sign a tre treaty with Germany. So again, that, um, for number five, it's going to be Lenin. Then back out and then Germany. Number six is going to be April 6, 1917, is when the United States declared war. And the reason that we declared war because uh, ships were still being sunk by Germany. So we have April 6, 1917, and ships. 
Okay. So now the United States enters the war. I have a question for the class. Do you guys think the United States was ready for war with Europe? Yes. Yes. Why do you guys think the United States was ready for war? You guys are right. I think you we're guys are like right, a big you... country. Like we're like we just had the military power for it, really. Yeah. Is it because you go on? Wait, what was the question? So the question was: Do you guys think? So we're looking at the first question here, number one. Was the United States prepared for war in Germany? I'm asking you guys. What do you guys think? Yes. Just had the numbers, yeah. I mean, you got remember something was going on. The United States was an industrial revolution, so we had a lot of industry. We had a lot of new technology, and I gotta ask you guys: What what do you do when you first get a new toy or a new phone? What's the first thing you start doing? You start you just leave it in the box. You start messing with it, huh? You start putting your information on it. Yeah, you start working with it, right? And that's what the United States was doing too during World War One. You had all this new technology you just got, and now you want to start make sure you um, use that material. You want to see what it does. You got a brand new toy. You want to see what's up with it. All right. So this is a big thing you guys got to make sure you know about is that um, we had a selected draft. So we look at 2B. It authorized a draft of young men for the American Expenditure Force. And the name of that army was the AEF, okay? AEF, you guys kind of see right there, American Expenditure Force. I cannot say that word right now. <laughs> Expeditionary. Thank you. Expeditionary force. And that was known as the AEF. Now, you guys are not going to necessarily need to know what the AEF is, but you need to know about the Selective Service Act because that's where we have a draft. Right now, all my young men is in this class. Once you turn 18, you're going to be forced to enter the draft. <laughs> you don't have a choice. You don't enter the draft, you don't get a driver's license. Congratulations. You can have a man. <laughs> Question, you guys. Was that segregation in the army? Yes or no? No. Yes. Yeah. They were. Remember, we're still living in Jim Crow right now, you guys. Remember, Jim Crow is what? What is the idea of Jim Crow? Separate but what? Equal. equal. Separate but equal. That included the military. Uh, can I get somebody to cut down the music in the background? All right, so that includes the military. If you already, could you, um, admit, Victoria, I know what's going on? Sure. Thank you. Okay, so major events of the war. The Americans saved Paris first, all right? So Paris is taken over by the Germans. First, make sure you guys know, both in World War I, World War II, Germany is known as the bad guy. Is that right with me so far? And I'm saying that in air quotes. So Germany went in, they took over um, France. So America comes in and takes, um, saves them, if you will. What weapons are a major part of the war? These are tanks. Does everybody know what a tank is? Yes. Yes. If not, just Google it real quick. You see a picture of it. Um, what is the major strategy of the war? Does anybody know that? Anybody know what the major strategy of the war? Advanced warfare. But it's something else going on. Wasn't it, it guerrilla warfare? Guerrilla would be more so in Vietnam, but it was something that's very, very different about World War I. And it's the reason why nobody won the war. Trench. Everybody remember that? Trenches, people used to dig a hole, go in the ground. Think about how stupid that sounds, you think about it. You dig a hole, you go in the ground, and it was called trench warfare. Is everybody got that? Yeah. And again, Google Trench, you guys will see what it says. All right, so the idea is, okay, everybody's told in America this war will be over by Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that didn't happen. Um, what occurred from late 1914 to 1917? Because of trench warfare, a stalemate occurred. Nobody was moving. If you guys go watch the movie Wonder Woman, this is another movie you guys can watch for extra credit. This is crazy how many movies you guys can watch for extra credit. You go watch Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman takes place during World War I. Is that right with me so far? Yeah. And the first major battle scene is when Wonder Woman comes out of a trench and starts fighting. 
Yeah, those trenches, the reason why you had a stalemate, because no one was ready to fight because everybody was basically had guns on top of those trenches. Every time someone was to peek their head up, they get shot. So you learn not to do that. Now, here's the problem with trenches. Everybody lived in the trench, used the bathroom in the trench, people died in the trench. This is where you had a lot of disease. I'm thinking of the disease because right now we're in the middle of COVID-19, right? Is that right with me? Yes. Yeah. Make yes. a side note here. You also have the, the um, Spanish flu of 1918. Did I say that right? Did I say the right date, um, Ms. Garrity and Malcolm? Wait, what did you say? Okay, so another thing that you had, so right now, I'm talking about trench warfare. You had everybody like being in the same area, but occupying the same space. And you had a lot of the diseases moving around, bacteria. You had a out, another um, major outbreak that happened with the, everybody, somebody cut down their music in the background. It was like they on hold for teleconference or something. But you had That's some of this, okay. So what you had is what was called as the Spanish, the, uh, Spanish flu. That was another major epidemic. It's probably the only time in world history where you have the same thing going on right now with COVID-19. So before there was a COVID-19, there was a Spanish flu. Is that right? Got me on that? Yes. Yeah. Now I'm going to talk more about Spanish flu to, uh, tomorrow. But just put that next to where you have trench warfare and a stalemate. Now, we're going to see down here where it says, uh, when does the war end? It ends on the 11th hour, on the 11th day, on the 11th month of 1918. Is that right? Got me on that? So 11, 11, 11. You had approximately 50,000 Americans that died. Approximately 50,000 Americans died. And from the positive that came out the war, you have better technology, medicine, and transportation. Is everybody with me? Yes. Okay, so just as another reminder, you guys will be able to go back and look at this recording of this to help you guys out. Now, for the astronaut act, I went ahead and typed this in for you guys because I want you guys to have that already. But I'm going to talk quickly about Eugene Debs and also the Great Migration. So Eugene Debs was the leader of the socialist movement during this time period. Eugene Debs was the leader of the socialist movement. He went to jail because of an anti-war speech. He went to jail for 10 years. He violated what was known as the Sedition Act. Is everybody with me so far? Yes. And again, don't put that in the chat because I'm, I'm not on the computer. I'm in front of the, the board moving it. So again, Eugene Debs was the leader of the socialist movement. Um, he went to jail because he violated the Sedition Act. And remember, the Sedition Act, you cannot talk bad about anything going on in the country, in this case here, World War I. And he went to jail for 10 years. What he wanted to do is to redistribute wealth and power amongst the workers. Y'all still with me? Yes. Now, here's the crazy thing. While he was in jail, he actually got 900,000 votes for the 1920 election. While he was in jail, he was still voting for him. So you did have, and what that tells us is that people still supported his ideal. Is it right? Follow me there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, why do I have to take time to make sure you guys know about Eugene Debs? Well, it's in the standards, but also it's, it's a topic that's being talked about right now. We don't want a socialist country. Well, it goes back to 1920. It's crazy how 100 years ago, we we're almost repeating some of the same stuff. Y'all follow me on that? Yes. Okay. FYI, you guys going to have extra credit coming up to watch the uh, presidential debate. And I'll tell you guys how it's going to be based like a tic-tac-toe. I'll tell you guys how that works later on, okay? All right, the next thing you have is the Great Migration. Um, simply put, this is where you have Black Americans fleeing the South to go up North. And the reason they're fleeing the South is because you got a couple things going on. The North has more jobs because of industry. 
They're run away from Jim Crow laws. You guys with me? Yes. What's the first reason they're moving up north? Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws. What else is going on up north? What's another thing to make them go up there? I said one more thing too. To be free. Well, that's the idea of getting away from Jim Crow. But remember, they had more industry. So that means they have more jobs, more factory jobs. They got me on that? Because down in the South, they had to be sharecroppers, which means they had, remember, if you remember sharecropping, it was a very bad system. They could move up North and be able to work in factories, whereas the South, they couldn't. So the first one was because they moved, the Great Migration because of uh, factory work in the North, run away from Jim Crow, also because of lynchings, all right? I didn't get into lynchings for us, but I'm gonna get into when we come back to the review part. And if you guys take me for ethnic studies, another plug, I'm really gonna go in detail with that. But lynchings, does everybody know what a lynching is? No. Yeah. Something like okay. a torture weapon or something like that. All right. So it's no way to say this other than show it to you. This is a lynching. You get your neck and you be hung up in the tree like this. You die because you're getting um, your trach. Is, I can't even do it to myself. <laughs> but that's what a lynching is. And what they was doing now, lynching was a huge thing in that time period. Um, I'm gonna make sure I get back. In. I'm gonna talk more about lynchings tomorrow too. So tomorrow I'm gonna get more into about lynchings and the Spanish flu. Okay, so guess what? It won't be on the test tomorrow. Make sure I take those questions off. All right, so that's what we got. So now let's get to the end of the war. I might try to pull up lynchings today. All right, so things I want to let you know about is on the home front. Make sure you guys understand about these Liberty Bonds. Make sure you guys know about rationing. We have to make sure basically like, you know, belt loops is metal. So not everybody was able to get a belt because we need that medal for the um, for the war effort. You also have Liberty Bonds as far as helping try to raise money for the war. This is also when we got daylight savings time, y'all. Turn clocks ahead one hour for uh, for the summer to lower fuel consumption. This is the reason why we have daylight savings time. Y'all good with me so far? Yeah. Can I get someone to read this quote by Woodrow Wilson? Anybody, please go ahead and read the quotes. I'll read it. Thank you. Uh, it's a open, open, what's it? Co covenants? Open yeah. covenants of peace openly arrive at, after which there shall be no private international understanding of any kind, but diplomacy shall proceed always frankly in, in the public view. Okay. So that's Woodrow Wilson. That's your answer you. going to be for, that, thank you so much for doing that. Uh, that's going to be for the 14 points. Well, the 14 points program was basically trying to way, well, Woodrow Wilson was trying to find a way to stop another world war from happening. We all know World War II happened, okay? So we got here 14 points for A. It's going to be Woodrow Wilson's plan for peace, okay? Woodrow Wilson's plan for peace. It didn't involve super harsh punishments for Germany as Wilson didn't want to instigate another war. Woodrow Wilson did not want to have another world war. Everybody in Europe wanted to punish and make Germany suffer. Keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen. World War I destroyed a lot of areas in, in um, Europe. Europe was basically just destroyed. There's no other way to say that. And they wanted to make Germany pay for that destruction. Okay? Point 14, the League of Nations. Okay? And then what I got here for you guys are the 14 points. Now, for the sake of a test and what's going on, you don't need to know what each point is, but just know the whole idea of what the 14 points was, was to stop another war from occurring. Is everybody got me on that? Yeah. Okay, so why did the League of Nations, LON, fail? Well, the United States didn't join. <laughs> the United States Congress refused to join the League of Nations, and the reason why they didn't want to join is because start, it started in Congress because Congress didn't like Wilson, so they didn't want to support his plan. For no other reason, Congress no longer liked the Woodrow Wilson, and they want to become isolationists, meaning be able to do their own selves. Is everybody with me so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
and I just kind of said it. Congress no longer wanted to be involved in foreign affairs. So that's why it kind of stalled. Now, World War I officially ended with the Treaty of Versailles. That's V-E-R-S-A-I-L-L-E-S. -L -L -E and that's how World War I officially ended. Now, keep this in mind. This is kind of old schoolyard rules. If you ever in a fight on the schoolyard, you never let someone just kind of walk away. You want to make sure it's a definite winner. Because then less likely that person will come back and want to fight again. Is everybody got me on that analogy? Yeah. There was no definite winner for World War I. Everybody just say, okay, look, we all die and let's just stop fighting. That means it was right for another war to occur. And as we know, World War II did occur. Something else you need to know about Woodrow Wilson on... In December of 1918, Woodrow Wilson became the first sitting president to move to travel outside of the Western Hemisphere. And he sailed to Paris to help to sign the Treaty of Versailles, which ended the war. Here's a graphic that says, what, is, um, what did the treaty say for Germany? You guys have a couple of questions here to answer. How fair was the treaty to Germany? Uh, which of the nations would have been most pleased with the outcome, meaning the treaty. Now, most importantly, think about the effects of the treaty for the future world. Remember that this treaty was to prevent another European war from ever breaking out. However, we all know what happened in 1939. What happened in 1939, ladies and gentlemen? What happened in 1939, ladies and gentlemen? Take a stab in the dark, just guess. I'm guessing the Treaty of Paris. World War II. Oh. World War II. And the reason why the United States cares so much about World War II is because of Pearl Harbor and because it was a World War II, but Pearl Harbor was the biggest thing for that, okay? All right, people. So that is everything I have for you guys. What well, I highly suggest you guys do, if you need to go back and rewatch that crash course, to so go ahead and do so. If you want to go back and um, look over this recording, I have this recording posted. I'll say no later than maybe really four o'clock today. I'm trying to get done a little bit earlier than that. Um, you have a pop quiz tomorrow. Would you, question for you guys, y'all get to pick. If you already do the pop quiz and gim kit or quizzes? Quizzes. Quizzes. Okay, so we all saying quizzes. Okay, you have your World War One quiz and quizzes tomorrow. Does that count for a grade? Yes. Yeah. It does. Yes, please. So, so make sure you guys review your notes. Make sure you guys you do fine on that. Um, if you have not taken the test, you have to what time today to take the test? Two. Or finish taking. Two o'clock. Two o'clock. And I see some people is already taking it. Some people are in there taking it. That's good. That's great. Uh, does anybody got any questions for me? No. Nope. Nope. All right. That's all I got for you guys today. That is all for World War I. Um, that's all y'all got to do. So y'all go ahead and handle your business. I'll see you guys bright early tomorrow morning. Stick uh, around if there's any questions. Thank you guys so much. You said there's, a, there's something due at 2 o'clock? Um, I said that if you did not take the Unit 4 test, it's currently open and it's due at four. It's, excuse me. It's due at two o'clock today because I have to put in grades. So it closes at two today. Yeah, that's only for people who didn't take it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I finished it. All right. All right. Oh, man. So that was World War One in a day. <laughs> I was going to say, you, you, just woo. It was it was flashbacks of the Civil War in one in one one block. <laughs> well done. Yeah, and then they got they got everybody. We got some pretty good detailed notes. I think I think I covered like literally that whole standard, maybe even some of sixteen. And then I'm gonna use the pop quiz tomorrow to review and see how people are doing. Um, and I think I'm still talking about World War One tomorrow too. And they, then wonder, uh, yeah, sorry. Ahead. I'm wondering if um if Jacob and um. Am I still on the call because they're taking their test? Uh, that's what I'm looking at right now. Yeah. Jacob did not, um, he didn't reply to me, so I, I don't.